Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this video is going to look at whether size matters, at least when it comes to ice axes. In particular, whether taller people use larger ice axes. And if you are thinking, well, duh, then congratulations, you have just solved the great mystery of the ice axe. This video will look at three different ice axes for which the size is known. The first is the backup ice axe of Howard Somerville, Somerville having dropped his primary ice axe on the descent during his June 4, 1924 climb with Norton. That ice axe is 35 inches in length. The second is the ice axe found by Wynne Harris in 1933, which belonged to either Mallory or Irvin. It is approximately 41 inches in length, and I will refer to that as the mystery ice axe. And the third is Andrew Irvin's backup ice axe, which is approximately 44 inches in length, and it was returned to his family after the expedition. These lengths of the two known ice axes will be compared to the heights of the climbers who used them, and a rather obvious correlation will be seen that taller people use longer ice axes. I'll then look at the other pieces of evidence, which are fairly conclusive that the ice axe currently on display at Merton College's Andrew Irvin exhibit actually belonged to George Mallory. In the video, Two and a Half Ice Axes, I covered some of the problems with the notion that the ice axe had belonged to Irvin and concluded it was equally likely to have been Mallory's. However, with all the new information that has come to light since then, there is little to no possibility it belonged to Irvin. As there has been a large number of new subscribers to this channel, I'll first go over the background of the ice axe. In 1933, Wynne Harris found an ice axe laying on a slab. The reported location was 60 feet below the crest of the ridge and 250 yards east of the first step. The location was marked on this photo. It allows us to position the ice axe with a fair degree of accuracy, and that location is just below the cave. When Wynne Harris found the ice axe on the ascent, he simply left it there. He then proceeded to traverse over, enter the couloir, and he got to approximately 28,100 feet where he and his climbing partner Wagger turned around. They took the same route back, and on the return, when Harris picked up the ice axe and left his own in its place. Thus, the location of the ice axe tells us little about which route Mallory and Irvin took, as the ice axe was on the route used to return from the couloir, and that would also be the exact same route to return from the zigzag. It doesn't really tell us much about which of those two routes they took. And while I do not consider a route up the second step viable, the ice axe would also be consistent with someone climbing that route, either going up the first step, as the modern route does, or bypassing the first step, as the Chinese did in 1960 in their failed summit attempt. The location does rule out that Mallory and Irvin followed Norton and Somerville's route of four days earlier, as that route is much lower down. In addition, it indicates they maintained a high traverse on the descent, most likely to return to their oxygen bottle cache. As the manufacturer of the oxygen system had detailed written instructions on oxygen bottle caching, and other oxygen ascents, such as those of Hillary and Norgay, used oxygen bottle caching, the location of the ice axe indicates they followed the same route on the descent that they did on the ascent, which would be required for oxygen bottle caching. On the other hand, if they were not caching bottles, they likely would have descended earlier and followed Norton and Somerville's route back to the camp as there was no reason to remain that high on the descent unless they were caching bottles. Since the ice axe was retrieved in 1933, there's been endless debate about whether it belonged to Mallory or Irvin, as no other climber had been close to that location. Initially, the axe was thought to be Mallory's on account of the manufacturer, Willis of Tayish, providing high-end Swiss-made axes which Mallory likely purchased on one of his trips to the Alps, while Irving, having never been to the Alps, was unlikely to have had such an axe. Joseph Willis was a blacksmith and mountain guide who handmade ice axes in Switzerland. Even now, a third generation of the family continues to make ice axes. The ice axes are custom handmade, and even with two brothers making the axes, the total output was limited to approximately 100 axes per year, thus the axes were fairly rare back in 1924. After the axe was returned to England, Odell noticed a set of triple nick marks on the axe, which he seemed to recall Irvin having used. However, upon contacting Irvin's father, none of Irvin's other equipment had that mark on it, and Irvin's father was not even certain Irvin ever used such a mark. In addition, when Harris claimed that the marks were not on the ice axe when he found it, but were placed there by a Sherpa at his request to clearly identify the axe. 
This year, Merton College is putting on an exhibit relating to Andrew Irvin, and enough information can be put together to determine that the ice axe is probably not Irvin's, but rather Mallory's. The following is what has been pieced together. The guidelines for the Mount Everest expedition told each member to bring two ice axes, and Irvin is reported to have indeed brought two. Irvin's second ice axe was returned to his family, and it has no such triple nick marks on it. I will refer to it as the Noan Ice Axe. It is known with certainty to have belonged to Irvin. The issue with the Noan Ice Axe is that it does not have any of those triple nicks or any other markings. Thus, Irvin clearly did not mark all his equipment with such a mark. Indeed, none of Irvin's Noan equipment had that mark on it. It is also not made by Willish, and it is significantly larger than the Mystery Axe. However, after Irvin's father, Willie, passed away, a swagger stick was found in Irvin's father's possession that had a triple nick mark on it. From this, it was somehow concluded that the swagger stick belonged to Irvin, with no explanation being as to why Willie Irvin never mentioned it while he was alive, even though he specifically addressed the issue of whether Andrew Irvin used the triple nicks to mark any of his equipment. The next piece of information is simply the size of the ice axe. In this photo at the Irvin exhibit, the two ice axes are shown next to each other, the known ice axe on top and the mystery axe found in 1933 on the bottom. From this, the known ice axe is about three inches longer than the Willish ice axe. Mallory was approximately six feet tall and Irvin is a good couple inches taller. Norton was reported as being six foot four and from this photo, it is hard to make any meaningful distinction between Norton's height and that of Irvin, though it was reported that Norton was taller than Irvin. And in this photo, Somerville can be seen to be shorter than Mallory. Thus, Irvin is the tallest, then Mallory, then Somerville. It should also be noted that the ice axes were used very differently in 1924 than they are today. Then, as now, they are used for a variety of things, but in terms of climbing, their use is completely different today than it was 100 years ago. Today, a short axe is used to plant in the snow on the upward slope, and modern ice axes are much shorter because of this use. In contrast, in 1924, they lacked stiff boots for crampons, and there were no front point crampons. Instead, a climber would cut steps in the snow or ice with the axe and then stamp into the slot with their boot to finish the creation of the step. This had the lead climber doing all the work, which typically resulted in rotating with another climber. These photos of Norton and Mallory from 1922 show both men using larger ice axes. But you can't really tell too much about the relative sizes of the axes from these photos. The only thing of note is that Norton's axe has a much wider shaft, which would not be consistent with the Willish ice axe. Similarly, Irvin's Noan ice axe has such a wider shaft, and likely people with larger frames, such as Norton's 6'4 frame, preferred such a wider axe. Looking at this photo, it shows Norton using the ice axe in his downhill hand, and such technique would be not only considered poor form by modern standards, but would be extremely dangerous with a smaller modern axe. However, for 1924, such climbing techniques were, made perfect sense, especially on the long rocky traverse where a modern axe would be worthless. Looking at the photo from the Irvin exhibit, Irvin's known ice axe is not only larger in length, it is also thicker in girth. And while it is possible that Irvin's second ice axe was three inches shorter than his known ice axe, there is no explanation as to why he would choose the smaller axe for his final climb. Thus, we are left with a series of bizarre occurrences that need to take place for both of these ice axes to have been Irvin's. First, Irvin had to acquire a Willish ice axe at some point. As he left England with two ice axes, and there is no explanation as to how he acquired a custom-made Swiss axe without ever having been to Switzerland, uh, if a friend had lent him the ice axe, that friend had to remain completely silent when the issue of the ice axe was being debated in the climbing community, and he had to not recognize that it was the axe that he had lent to Irvin. Thus, the possibility of Irvin having taken a Willish ice axe with him on the expedition is extremely small. Alternately, one expedition member recalled that Willish ice axes were supplied to the expedition, though this would be for the Sherpas, who did not have their own. First, the problem is that neither myself nor anyone else has found receipts or any other records of the Willish axes being purchased for the expedition, with the only account being somebody recalling in 1933 the manufacture of ice axes used nine years earlier. We have records of the manufacturers of almost all the other equipments, tents, stoves, all sorts of stuff, but no records have been found proving that Willish ice axes were actually purchased for the expedition. And the recollection of an expedition member nine years after the expedition 
took place might simply be mistaken. Even assuming Welsh ice axes were supplied to the Sherpa, Irvin had to then trade his axe with the Sherpa and fail to make any reference to this in any of his rather extensive diary entries. In this photo, it does not appear that any of the Sherpas were supplied with 41-inch ice axes, and it is difficult to believe the expedition would bring 41-inch ice axes for the Sherpas when someone with an average build, such as Somerville, used a 35-inch axe. While ice axes can be shortened, the person who likely would have done such a thing was Irvin, and he notes in his diary that he repaired Mallory's ice axe, but he has no notes at all about shortening ice axes for any of the Sherpas. Finally, Irvin had to choose the shorter of his two ice axes for his final climb, even though the extensive snow slopes and long rocky traverse greatly favored the larger axe for his larger body. Of course, Irvin would also have never climbed anything other than up to North Cole with his newly acquired Willish ice axe, so he would have had to prefer an axe he had extremely limited experience with. In contrast, the axe belonging to Mallory only requires that he purchased a high-end custom-made Swiss axe on one of his numerous trips to the Alps, and then chose to take his custom-made axe on his final climb because of his long familiarity with its use. Thus, Based on the size of Irvin's known ice axe compared to the one found in 1933, the significant size difference is a good indication it was Mallory's and not Irvin's. The primary argument against the axe being Mallory's is the belief that Mallory had a hole in his head made by an ice axe. Obviously, if Mallory had such a wound, the most likely explanation would be that he was holding his ice axe with him in an arrest position when it bounced off a rock and injured his skull. That would mean his ice axe could not have been left up 60 feet below the ridge. The issue with the alleged hole in Mallory's head will be covered in an upcoming video, but for now it is sufficient to note that the existence of such a hole is highly suspect, and if an ice axe size hole does exist in Mallory's skull, it is far more likely to have been put there by the 1999 team while they were digging up the body. Had his head been split open while he was alive, such an injury would have resulted in a massive amount of blood, making it impossible to separate Mallory's face from the rocks. As Mallory's face was lifted and photographed, it was clearly not frozen to any rocks. That the photographs remain secret and some independent medical examiner can't simply be shown one and provide a report on the size and location of the alleged hole makes the account difficult to believe. Based on the verifiable information, such as the manufacture of the ice axe, the lack of any identifying marks on Irvin's known ice axe, and the size of Irvin's known ice axe, the Willish ice axe is far more likely to have been Mallory's.